Welcome to Going Underground with me, Afshin Ratansi. Every Monday, Wednesday and Saturday, we're bringing you the stories that really matter in the United Kingdom for those of you wishing to question more. In today's show, jobless and hopeless, as queues get bigger at job centers, we question whether they're really trying to get you off the dole and into work. Plus, did the Snowden leaks put us all in danger? The debate rages on, but our government ministers are refusing to back up their melodramatic claims. And if you feel the need to wean yourself off social media, shock therapy could be the answer. For these stories and more, let's go underground. The debate over whether Edward Snowden's leaks have damaged national security or not is still raging, but the public is not getting any new answers. Before the end of the year, MPs grilled Home Secretary Theresa May, although who they really wanted to see again was the head of MI5. Theresa May kept saying that she was appalled that The Guardian has put us all at risk, but refused to provide any evidence and tell us how. Nothing new there, she acts as a messenger of the Intelligence and Security Committee who stick to the line from number 10. After all, David Cameron appoints them. With me is Russ Baker, editor of whoughtwhy.com, a New York-based journal. Thank you very much for coming on Going Underground, Russ. Let's start with your um, view of how Britain has been covering the NSA scandal as opposed to the United States. It's very, very weak. I was struck by it because I consider the U.S. response even a bit weak, and this is much, much weaker. Um, really, other than The Guardian, almost the entire media here has shown very, very little interest. And of course, I wonder if a lot of that is just competitive pressures. The Guardian out front in the world on this story, the rest of them uh, basically saying, well, there's nothing here, and s seeming to suggest that The Guardian itself is the problem. So it's worse than the American media. We it, always it is much hearing. worse, yeah. Great. Well, I'm sure lots of British journalists will be very happy about that. Uh, it isn't just the competition, presumably. There are people here going, that newspaper here should be prosecuted. In the United States, of course, they can't prosecute a newspaper officially because of your constitution. Uh, what did you think of that? Well, I mean, I'm hearing more and more discussion here that Britain needs some constitutional changes, needs basic protections for freedom of speech and freedom of the Since the, of the 11th press. century this is, or <laughs> recently? Uh, recently. I mean, I think people are getting an idea that this is something that has to come to pass. And uh, one big event, as it were, was the unprecedented uh, evidence given by the head of MI6, MI6 MI5, GCHQ. Were you impressed by that? Uh, no. Um, uh, really what I thought was remarkable was the uh, first of all, you can see that the people on that committee were appointed by the Prime Minister because the, the passivity, uh, I, I saw that the Guardian suggested ten questions they might want to ask and they asked almost none of them. Those they did, they were sort of so open-ended that uh, they were able to kind of hit those balls right out of the park. But then, so committees in America, upon which the select committee process was based, they would be able to uh, grill the... Well, they did. They, they had them on Capitol Hill. They, they would be... Keith Alexander, you thought the questions against him were the, as tough as the ones on our head of GCHQ? They were tougher. You know, the, the thing is that uh, the structure of the American Congress is different, and uh, the president is not appointing the members of the committee. It's not ideal, but it certainly is more vigorous than what we're seeing here. Although, of course, you have executive power, and the president has said that Snowden... Uh, has to answer criminal charges. That's the, that's the situation at the moment. He's in a difficult position because his power base, uh, Obama's power base basically is very, very concerned about this and he has to show some concern about the sort of encroachments on civil liberties. Of course, Britain has been divided from Europe to a certain extent with European leaders criticizing David Cameron. Do you think, uh, do you think GCHQ and the relationship between GCHQ and the NSA trumps all of Britain's other uh, alliances, diplomatic alliances? I don't think it trumps it. I think it complicates it because I, I think you might call it sort of the little brother to the big brother and big brother with the double entendre there with all the surveillance. But I mean, I think this is a, a long-standing and important relationship. Historically, uh, GCHQ uh, and the NSA have always been able to help each other because whenever there was a law, let's say in the United States, that the NSA couldn't uh, spy on uh, Americans, then uh, GCHQ could do it for them. And so this is a very important relationship. And I think we'll continue to see that being very, very strong. So what do you think Americans think, those who know, of uh, the American government, or is it CIA, or is it, G or is it NSA, 
paying uh, GCHQ in effect to spy on people. I think there's growing. I, I mean, we didn't realize GCHQ was for hire here. Obviously, <laughs> there's growing concern about all of this. I think there's go growing concern here too. My my uh, driver this morning was expressing, I think, the, the younger generation. Bus driver, kind of, I hope. Uh, this is. <laughs> <laughs> can concern about about uh, about you know lack growing lack of trust in government in general. Uh, but uh, I, I I think that uh, there there is a concern in the United States. Uh, about all of the agencies and what exactly are they doing and is there any kind of oversight or control by the democratic process. And the usual response which is uh, so much in the press when uh, papers other than The Guardian reported, everyone knows everyone bugs everyone, what's the big deal? Uh, do you see that uh, defense uh, being eroded in some ways amongst the I, I different do. generations? I do. I, I think that the public is being increasingly divided between those who say, well, everybody does it, and those who say, you know, this is an incremental thing, and if it gets worse and worse and worse, we could have some real, real problems in terms of our basic liberties. So even splits within the government here? I, I think so. I mean, in, in, in my conversations here, uh, uh, just casually, um, part on holiday here, but uh, in conversation with some folks, uh, I see that there's splits within the Tories, uh, and there's a very strong kind of libertarian streak there, and, and those people actually seem to me more uh, vocally concerned about this than Labour. But on the committee, the uh, members were getting answers like, this is just a pedophilia, bugging your emails and phone calls and so forth. Yeah, I was struck by that. Th th this is quite common that, that, that when uh, the government is not getting the kind of response that it wants from the public. It starts citing things that, ex that interest and concern people and certainly if you say well we need to do this in order to stop the kind of crimes like pedophilia that, that people do uh, understand and, and certainly are, are concerned about, uh, they're able to get more of a reaction. Well, we'd better let them go ahead and do whatever they need to do. But a gift for Al-Qaeda? You know, uh, I was struck again by a statement uh, that uh, one of the heads of the intelligence agencies uh, uh, made, I think it was GCHQ, and he said that they were just rubbing their hands together with glee uh, and that they had seen uh, signs that these people are changing their methods. And yet, what, what, how did he see signs of that? Their surveillance was picking up people openly talking about this. So if they're really changing their methods, then why are they picking them up having these kinds of conversations? But they did say 34 terror attacks were foiled using... Uh, I, these message intercept and bugging email. And so yeah, forth. I mean, I would like to know more about the nature of those. They can't because, tell you. That's the whole point. Well, we, we've had the same thing in the United States where they were forced to backpedal, and then they had to admit that they weren't sure how many of these actually involved successful surveillance, how many of them involved what's called human human intelligence from actual spies. And the reality is that if you if you read very carefully what they're saying, they're not actually saying that they were terror plots. They're saying that some of them were people who were talking about or thinking about. And in the end, what we may be talking talking about is, is regular folks who are just angry about something and saying something and no more than that. Finally, how close are, are our elites, political elites, with the United States establishment framework? You've written about the Blair-Bush connection. What do you think about this next generation of uh, uh, the connections between the Obama administration and politicians in power here? I think it's very strong and it's growing stronger as we become more and more of a uh, a multinational world, transnational world. I think the old notions of sort of Americans versus Brits versus uh, Germans and so forth are becoming uh, less true as we see these companies and so forth having uh, their cross-border cross loyalties. And, and, and so I think that's going to be reflected in government as well. They're not competing trade blocks. That's not anymore. No, the they're not. No, no. They're, they're in alliance. I, I think so. Russ Baker, thank you for going underground. My pleasure. We've all witnessed the seemingly unstoppable rise of the selfie. The word even made it into the Oxford English Dictionary as the word of the year of 2013. But while it may be expected for young models and singers to post selfies on Twitter and Instagram on a daily basis, it seems politicians are now keen to get in on the trend too. Of course, sometimes the camera angles not all that flattering. At number four, Nick Clegg, who does a weekly radio phone-in called Clegg, was asked by presenter Nick Ferrari to take his first ever selfie on the show. Posted online, Ferrari looked more than happy, which is lucky because Clegg doesn't look too thrilled. 
At number three, UKIP leader Nigel Farage took a selfie in his Brussels office to prove that he doesn't spend all his time in the pub. This was in response to a jibe by Lib Dem MEP Fiona Hall, calling him a Mr. Mirage due to the lack of time he'd spent in the European Parliament. Kudos for being in the office, but taking selfies doesn't count as work, Nigel. At number two, opposition leader Ed Miliband is really trying hard to win over voters. And he thinks a good way to do that is to take selfies with celebrities. The one with Joey Essex of The Only Way Is Essex fame is a cracker. But we do wonder, did either of them know who each other was? And at number one, as the world mourned the death of Nelson Mandela at the end of last year, David Cameron thought the memorial service would be a really good time to smile and barge in on someone else's selfie. Danish Prime Minister Heli Thorning Schmidt was trying to take one with US President Barack Obama, but Cameron didn't want to be left out. Michelle Obama was singularly unimpressed with their antics, echoing British distaste at such unseemly behavior at a funeral. Spending more time on Facebook than with your real friends? Worried more about retweets than your day job? Join us after the break to find out how you can kick your social media addiction once and for all. Plus, it turns out that the cut from your overpriced train ticket is going into foreign pockets. Work and Pension Secretary Ian Duncan Smith has come under fire from his opposite number for being in denial about the benefit system. If it wasn't bad enough that £40 million has been wasted on insecure benefit software, Duncan Smith's plans for reform of universal credit are apparently running two years late. Meanwhile, queues at job centres across the country are lengthening and the rate of long-term youth unemployment is at its highest level in a decade. With me is former Parliamentary Private Secretary to Prime Minister Gordon Brown and Labour MP for South Wirral, Alison McGovern. Welcome to Going Underground, Alison. Hi. The Prime Minister, so keen to talk about how wonderful the Tory Lib Dem policies are going because unemployment's down. Why doesn't that match with people's experience? Well, it doesn't match because underneath that picture, uh, We've got a whole host of problems in our economy, even now, wages held down, prices going up in the shops, and added to that, the uncertainty that some people experience because they're on zero hours contracts, or they're in a part-time job, and they can't get the hours that they want. Well, I know that under the last Labour government, the average job centre, you'd have a situation where you'd have to fill out endless forms. Uh, these were reforms by the Gordon Brown government. Uh, because they weren't there before. You had to fill out constantly that you'd applied for jobs. There'd be these machines which just gave you jobs for infantrymen in Afghanistan, as far as I saw it. Uh, what is the problem with job centres and the experience of those looking for jobs at the moment? Okay, so some, some of the work that I've done on job centres has looked at people's experience of the labour market. So I don't think it's enough for us to just rely on statistics and think everything's fine for people. People also have their own lived experience of what it's like for them either trying to get a job or in the labour market itself. And as I say, because of so much uncertainty, that's actually not a good place uh, for people to be. The specific problem in the job centre is that a lot of the um, targeted help that was there to support people has been stripped away. The work programme, which replaced Labour's New Deal... But was it ever very good anyway? Could we transport ourselves back to the 1980s? We would visit a dole office that was uh, unfriendly, unwelcoming, um, you know, those old-fashioned kind of counters with grills and all of that. When Labour got in, we wanted to do something totally different, and we wanted to put in proper back-to-work support, which we did for the first time ever under the New Deal. Um, that New Deal was set up to help specific groups of people, uh, for younger people, older people, and what have you, and it was internationally thought to be a very good scheme and quite successful, and we did much better in getting people back to work, specifically lone parents, people who face significant barriers to the labour market. And now you're my, saying my there is humiliation now. Yeah, my argument with the government is centers. my argument with the government is they put the resource in the wrong place. So they've got big global uh, companies doing back to work efforts um, that are not specifically targeted at localities. Um, local this is the work program. Yeah, the the work program, which I think most people think has been quite unsuccessful. Um, local authorities where 
you have people who really understand the local labour market and understand the kind of the history of that place and what the job opportunities might be for the future. Local authorities have seen the worst cuts of anybody. The other thing is, you know, the way that job centres are being managed is um, the processes are being delineated so that there's, there's very little relationship possible between the advisor and the person being trying to help at the moment. And I've seen it for myself with my own eyes that I don't think advisors in job centres are supported enough to, to help them do that, that good job. And so people feel uh, like they feel worse. And so under Labour, there are rumours, people are suggesting that you might even abolish 18 to 25 year old unemployment? Well, I... Perhaps you'd, that would pay for all these better services, but uh, the, you'd means the biggest, test it You know further? what the biggest challenge that young people face, actually, is a worry about getting a job. I think young people know that if you have a bad start in your career, that it's going to stay with you. And I think we have to say to young people, look, uh, we will make sure that there is a job for you. And the flip side of that is you need to take it. And that's why we've... Uh, put in place a policy that says we'll have jobs guarantees and I think that that is the that is the best way to make sure that the kind of corrosive uh, impact of unemployment right at the start of your career doesn't hurt people but in the given, way it did. But given, I, I'm, for, I'm from Merseyside right? right and I grew up in a time where basically people knew if you want to get ahead if you want to get a job you've got to leave the place you love and that's not right. So what we need to do is to say for every city and every town in Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, right, if you're a young person there, that you can get a job and you can make a start to your career. And not you the on your bike, Norman Tavish. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you, if you work hard, the government will back you. I think we have to say to young people that we will have this deal, that there will be a job for you. The deal is you have to take it. If people that are is, looking... You're forcing young, people, people bet young people to take a job that they don't even want between the ages of 16 and 25. You have, you have to give people... To all get the, their money. You have to give people all the support possible to get into the career they want to. Otherwise they get cut from unemployment benefit completely. But it ha you have, there have to be some requirements in this. You can't just... It can't be an unconditional system, and it, and it never has been, actually. You know, there's always been requirements there about things that people have to do. The fear that young people share with me is whether there'll be a job for them. I think that's a situation that cannot continue. The scarring impact of that that I've seen on my own community and elsewhere in the country is too much of a price to pay, and we need a government that will do something about that. Alison McGovern, thank you very much. It seems that our government thinks that any state can take care of our railways, as long as it's not our own. Two-thirds of our rail operators are owned by foreign companies. We have the most expensive fares in Europe, but that money is then passed on to transport networks overseas. East Coast is the only company to return its profits to our government but its future is uncertain. From February 2014, companies will be able to bid for it. It looks like our privatized rail network will continue to fracture, but some are fighting back. With me is Ellie Harrison, the founder of Bring Back British Rail. Ellie, welcome to Going Underground. Let's take us through and remind our audience about the West Coast, first of all, because there were developments some months ago regarding that franchise. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about one of the 17 key franchises in this ridiculous privatised system that we have in the UK for running our railways. And in October 2012, it was put out to tender um, for lots of different private companies to bid to run that franchise. And Richard Branson and his Virgin Rail are running it at the moment, and they've been running it for the last 15 years. And they put in a bid. And also First Group, who run the whole of the network in Scotland at the moment, and lots of other franchises around the UK, put in a bid. And they were awarded the franchise. And Richard Branson was very, very angry about this, quite understandably, because this cash cow that he'd had for the last 15 years was about to be snatched away from him. So he got first groups bid and went through all the fine print and found that one of the figures that were in there, the decimal place was in 
um, in, the wrong, in the wrong position, so it being completely misread. So first it being given this franchise. So who judged the bid? Well, it was the Department for Transport um, who thought, oh, this is good value for money, let's give it to first. So I guess Richard Branson did a, s a service to a certain extent, um, but obviously he was only looking out for his, his own interest. But what, what the Department for Transport decided to do was they were concerned about this and about the franchising process in general, as they should be, and they decided to put a temporary halt on all refranchising. Tell us a little bit about the rest of the network and the way it uh, is in a way nationalised, but it's nationalised because it's European nations that own British rail infrastructure. It's completely absurd, the system that we have in the UK. And, you know, we're really... Our railway network and loads of our public services, we're being, they're being run, we're being used as a guinea pig for the rest of Europe, a free market haven. And the other countries like Germany and France and Netherlands in particular are seeing this as a fantastic opportunity to come into the free market and take over the running of our, of our public services and to hone off, you know, all of all of the profits that they're making to subsidise their own public services. We're a laughing stock and our government thinks that this is great because it's adding to, to competition and that passengers are getting a better service as a result. Um, but obviously the people who are really benefiting are the passengers in countries like France and Germany who have functional public transport systems that they can actually afford to use. And it, which is being subsidised by the British uh, passenger, so uh, do you think it's European competition legislation that means that the ideologue, free market ideologues can't stop European nation states from buying up and profiting from our uh, uh, odd travel network? Exactly. I mean, there are European directives w which state how public transport systems have to be run in certain, in, in all of the European um, countries. But different countries have interpreted them differently. So in France, they've managed to keep SNCF, which is the publicly owned um, rail network, in public ownership. They've used the EU directives to their advantage. Whereas in this country, we've taken these EU directives and read them as meaning, ah, oh, we've got to fragment everything into as many little pieces as possible and let private companies run away with it. And what are the practical implications for travellers in, uh, passengers travelling from destinations that aren't that uh, close to big cities and uh, let alone the, the average commuter who's paying, of course, a fortune to travel. Well, the big problem is, and this is why I started the campaign, because I'm a passionate passenger and, you know, I'm coming at this from a, a passenger perspective in that I have first-hand experience of being really, really frustrated trying to get from one place in, in, in the UK to another when you have to go on so many different franchises. It's completely incoherent. And also, there's no cooperation between different... When, once you get to... Uh, when you have to change trains between one franchise and another, and if one is late, then they won't wait. That's it. You just miss the next connection, and you can be waiting for up to an hour. So that there's, there's, there's a lot more... Um, risk involved in terms of uh, delays, but also it's really complicated to buy a ticket because of this sort of engineered free market. The only way you can have innovation in a monopoly like the railways is by having a ridiculously complex uh, fare structure, which is what we've got at the moment. And that's what makes me sick when I was looking at the Department for Transport website, um, where they're tendering, they're, they're putting invitation to tender for the East Coast Men Line is that they, they're looking for creative bids um, with, with, with innovation. But there's only so much innovation you can have on a train line that goes from A to B. All passengers want is an efficient service that they can afford to use. But all we're going to end up with is, you know, trains painted different colours and ridiculously complex tickets that nobody will understand. The Secretary of State for Transport and so on, they, they don't really want uh, things to change. They still believe in this 20-year-old now privatisation process. What can passengers do? Well, passengers can get angry and I think passengers... The, the, the system is set up in an overly complex way so that people who are using the trains don't necessarily realise where their money is going and how corrupt the whole system is. So I think we, what Bring Back British Rail is trying to do is create awareness about the fact that 
when they pay for these expensive tickets, it's not that that money's being reinvested in improving the railways, it's going to subsidise uh, public transport systems in other countries, or it's getting whisked away into the pockets of already very wealthy shareholders who probably don't rely on the railways at all. So I think it's creating awareness about how this system is um, an injustice to the people who need to use it in the UK because public services should be run for the benefit of the people who need to use them. Ellie Harrison, thank you for going underground. Thank you. No matter how much you love looking at photos of your long-lost school friends, there always comes a day when you realise that enough is enough. Your Facebook addiction has to go. That's how two PhD students from MIT University felt. Robert R. Morris and Dan McDuff invented Pavlov Poke to help them fight social media temptations. Their device tracks how long you spend on Facebook, and if you're on there for too long, it gives you a harmless but unpleasant Pavlovian electric shock. Think that won't work? Well, instead of shocks, the device also posts a job request on an online marketplace. It offers complete strangers one pound to ring you up and shout at you for using the social media website. The project may have started as a joke, but the pair say they want to draw attention to our social media habits. But while there's no plans to roll out the Pavlov poke to the marketplace, it may come in useful. I'm pretty sure the Going Underground team is flicking through endless Christmas party photos as we speak. Join us next time as we go underground to bring you the latest beneath the mainstream from around the UK. Don't forget, you can drop us a line on Twitter at underground underscore RT, like our page on Facebook, or email us going underground at rttv.co.uk. See you on Wednesday.